Welcome. My name is Meredith Malnick, and I am Executive Health and Science Editor at HuffPost, and I'm today's moderator. Um, we're here today to talk about the diabetes epidemic, and specifically the latest in treatment and prevention. And, uh, and I want to start by introducing our all-star panelists, um, starting with my immediate right. Um, LaShawn McKeever is the Senior Vice President, um, Government Affairs and Advocacy at the American Diabetes Association. Sarah Bleich is a Professor of Public Health Policy at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Elizabeth Halpern is Clinical Director of Adult Diabetes and a member of the Jocelyn Latino Diabetes Initiative. And Howard Wolpert is Vice President for Medical Innovation at the Lilly Innovation Center. Um, and I also just want to mention that the event today is presented jointly with HuffPost um, and is part of the Dr. Lawrence H. and Roberta Cohen forums. And welcome to Roberta Cohen today. Um, we're pleased to have the whole Cohen family with us. Um, we're streaming live on the websites of the forum and HuffPost. And we are also streaming on Facebook. Uh, this forum will include a brief Q&A and you can email questions to the forum at hsph dot harvard dot edu and you can also participate in a live chat that's happening right now on the forum site um, so just to start you know today is world diabetes day and it's actually i just learned american diabetes month as well um, and so i think it's a really appropriate time uh, for us to talk about the ongoing scope of the diabetes epidemic in this country um, and and the, the disproportionate impact that it has on some of our communities um, and some of the, the newest approaches and technologies and, and ways that we can overcome some of the, the um, problems and roadblocks that we still face. Um, so I just want a word about uh, our focus. Obviously, diabetes is a massive topic. Um, and so we're really going to be uh, talking about type 2 diabetes. Um, and as you know, diabetes is a, a group of metabolic disorders that includes type 1, type 2, and gestational. Um, and you know, I think we'll touch on some some uh, topics that, that affect all types of diabetes, but really we're, our focus is going to be type 2 today. Um, and, uh, you know, I think uh, we're going to address some of the misconceptions that exist in society, um, a lot of the ideas around um, to what extent uh, illness is, relates to personal responsibility and, and, and some of the ways that we're not addressing the systemic issues that really face, face people who, who struggle with these. Um, with these challenges. So, um, you know, to start, we're going to actually watch a video clip. Uh, it is a, a, a video clip from the American Diabetes Association. They were kind enough to share with us. Um, and we're going to hear from someone who's living with diabetes and, and some of the challenges that, that she faces as a result. We used to travel to Beaufort, South Carolina, where our grandmother lived. One year I would go down and I know she would be having some troubles with circulations. And so I'll go down still another summer. Maybe she's had a toe amputated, a leg amputated. And that went on for some time until she actually um, passed away. Diabetes is a progressive disease. It wasn't just my grandmother, it was my aunt, it was my uncle, it was my cousin. I just never thought it would get to me. And so when it did, I was shocked. I knew that people had these misconceptions about type 2s. I didn't want to share with anybody that I had diabetes at all. It was a huge hurdle for me. I remember hiding insulin in refrigerators. I just felt shame. That is, in fact, how I started volunteering with the American Diabetes Association as a way for me to cope. Maya Angelou said it best, you know, when we know better, we do better. I'm a SNAP Ed program assistant. So um, that's what I do every day. I go out into the community and share nutrition education um, messages, if you will. Nutrition plays a major role in um, diabetes. I always use myself as an example, which is a huge accomplishment over the years because I went from hiding insulin in the closet, not sharing my story with anyone, to using my story if I need to, to help show that, hey, you can do it. So LaShawn, I want to start with you. I was hoping that you could sort of give us a, a lay of the land, so to speak, and, and talk through some where we are really as a um, as a culture and facing facing this this uh, disease, and you know how many people are facing it, and mm -hmm. the whole landscape. 
Sure. Um, one, I'm really excited to be here today. As she said, today is World Diabetes Day. This is American Diabetes Month. And really our focus during this month is to talk about the seriousness of diabetes, to try and combat the stigma surrounding diabetes, and to really help people understand just the magnitude of this disease and why it's important for us to, to act. So uh, I think the first thing uh, I want to share is the scope of the disease. Um, nearly 50% of Americans have diabetes or prediabetes. And so that's one in three Americans are at risk for developing diabetes. Diabetes affects 30.3 million children and adults in the U.S. today. And that, so that's one in 11 Americans. Um, one thing that we find is that no one really believes they're the one. Um, and so there's a huge issue with people who are at risk for developing diabetes. There are 84.1 million Americans who have diabetes and are at risk for developing type, um, type 2 diabetes. And nearly 90% of American adults with prediabetes don't know that they have it. So those are just some of the numbers in terms of the scope of the disease. But why is this really important? Well, it's important because diabetes is a costly disease. Um, if the complications go untreated, it leads to significant um, challenges for people living with the, the, the disease, and also it has a great uh, economic cost. So it is the seventh leading cost, cause of death in the United States, and it causes more death than AIDS and breast cancer combined. In addition, uh, I talked about the complications, so blindness is an important complication that it causes, heart disease, stroke, kidney failure, and amputations. Um, in understanding the economic burden of diabetes and prediabetes, it costs $322 billion each year um, in terms of healthcare related costs. Uh, and that, the, those, is 2.3 times higher than someone else with diabetes. So it's a very com costly disease. It carries a great burden for people who live with the disease. Uh, so, and today we're talking about, um, or part of what we're discussing is World Diabetes Day globally. Uh, according to data from the World Health Organization in 2015, 422 million people worldwide are living with diabetes today. So this is a huge issue as it relates from a public health perspective. And I think it's important for the folks that are gathered here today to talk about some of the solutions and how do we move forward from here. Um, two other things I wanted to note is that, um, you know, when you think about the problems related to diabetes, uh, the issues that a lot of disproportionately impacted populations face, um, are a strong contributor to some of the issues that we're seeing in terms of the inequity in access to health care. And um, so that, that's just one thing I just wanted to note. We're going to talk a little bit about that later. Um, but then also the part that I think is important is to talk about the stigma. So uh, Michelle in her video, she talked a little bit about that, how she had to hide her insulin in the refrigerator and she didn't want people to know that she had diabetes. That's something that we hear about from the diabetes community um, a significant portion of the time. People um, are afraid that they are at risk of, of developing diabetes, so they won't go and find out if they're at risk or to um, understand uh, their current health status. Um, it causes shame. People feel that they caused it um, themselves. Um, and so, again, it, it interferes with the treatment and management of the disease for a person with diabetes. Um, and it leads to a lot of misinformation regarding um, what diabetes really is. Um, and so it is a multifactorial disease. So it's a combination of genetic factors, lifestyle factors. There's a lot of things that contribute to it. And some of, some of those things a person can control, but there are other things like your, your genetic makeup that you can't control that puts one at risk for diabetes. So, you know, I think this is an important panel for us to have today. Um, you know, we certainly at the American Diabetes Association, this is something that, um, you know, diabetes is a part of our fabric. Um, and so I'm really interested to hear what, our, uh, the, what the other panelists have to say, but I wanted to provide a, sort of the scope of the disease. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's so, so helpful and so interesting to um, really see. It's something that affects all of us, basically, someone mm -hmm. we know or ourselves. Um, so you mentioned uh, that that it's multifactorial and that, that one of the factors is is um, you know uh, behavioral and, and, and you know the food we eat and so Sarah I wanted to um, to go to you and to hear a little bit more about um, you know some of the challenges and also some of the successes with sort of um, food policy and how how addressing the food environment can affect uh, health. Thanks, Meredith. So as you heard Michelle say at the outset, 
Diet is a huge driver of the diabetes epidemic, and this is important because a person's ability to control their diabetes is very dependent on their ability to select foods or be in an environment which allows them to control their blood sugar. And it's also the case that the single biggest driver of the diabetes epidemic is being overweight or obesity. So food policies become really important because those are a way to modify what people eat and potentially both affect their diabetes and their obesity. And there are all sorts of food policies at the local level, at the state level, at the federal level. Um, but the two that I want to talk about today are sugary beverage taxes and federal menu labeling. And sugary beverage taxes are a really important example because those beverages are the single source, the single largest source of added sugar in the diets of American adults and American children. And consuming those drinks is very tightly linked to both obesity and type 2 diabetes. And so across the United States right now, there are seven localities which have passed sugary beverage taxes. Those range from one cent per ounce up to 1.75 cents per ounce in Seattle, which most recently passed a tax. And to put that in context, if you take Philadelphia, which has a 1.5 cent per ounce tax, what that's equivalent to is taking a two liter bottle, which costs $1.79, adding about a dollar to it or increasing the price by 61%. So there are big increases that consumers are experiencing when these taxes go into effect. And there's not a lot of real world data right now in the US because these taxes are relatively new. What the data from Berkeley shows is that in the first year post-tax, sales of the drinks that were taxed, so sugary beverages, dropped by 10%. In our preliminary analyses of the Philadelphia beverage tax evaluation, which are not yet published, um, but we've just finished the six-month evaluation, we're seeing a 57% drop in volume sales of sugary beverages. And because low-income populations are more likely to drink these beverages, the potential population health effects are really important when we think about diabetes and obesity. And if you turn to menu labeling, menu labeling is the idea that if you go into a restaurant or a large food retailer, calories are posted alongside price. And so this first happened in New York City in 2006 and then sort of disseminated around the country to 20 or 30 other locations. And it's a great example of how local policy percolates up to the federal level. Because in 2010, as part of the Affordable Care Act, they actually passed federal menu labeling, which was strongly endorsed by then First Lady Michelle Obama's Let's Move campaign. And so it is, it is the current state is that the law has not yet been implemented. It's gonna be implemented in May of 2018. But even in the absence of the law actually going into effect, there's been a lot of research which has asked the question, does it actually have an effect on consumers and does it have an effect on restaurants? And what the research shows is that the biggest impact from menu labeling is probably not because consumers like us or anyone make different choices when they walk into restaurants and they see calories posted. The biggest impact is probably because restaurants are reformulating their menus to offer lower calorie products. And so in work that we've done looking at the largest chain restaurants in the country, what we've seen is that restaurants are both taking the highest calorie items off of their menus and they're also reducing the calories in newly introduced items that are constantly coming on menus by about 60 calories or 12%. Now it sounds small, but at a population level, if you can extract that number of calories out of the diet, it can actually have a pretty big impact on levels of both obesity risk and diabetes risk. And the last point that I wanna make is that there is a little bit of hope. And so I mentioned that sugary beverages are a really important target because they're such a key source of added sugar. We have a paper that came out today that looks at trends in sugary beverages um, from 2003 up to the most recent data in 2014. And what we find is that over that period, among kids and adults across all age groups, we're actually seeing declines in sugary beverage consumption, which is great. Now the downside is that the highest levels of consumption are still amongst blacks, Mexican-Americans, other Hispanic groups, adolescents and young adults who are also at high risk, highest risk for type 2 diabetes. So there's a need to think about among the groups who are at, still at highest risk, how can policies be targeted to most effectively impact them? Great. And so, you know, obviously from a policy level, trying to, to address everyone at once, um, that's the, the goal, but I, I wonder if uh, Liz could tell us a little bit about how you interact with individual patients and how um, you know, how you sort of uh, work with them to make the, the food choices on the, on the individual level. So thanks, Meredith. Um, at the Jaws and Diabetes Center, we're unique in that we, um, we're uniquely concentrating on diabetes and only diabetes. So that gives us um, a lot of time to spend with patients more than a primary care doctor has, for, in for instance. Um, so a colleague of mine said to me yesterday, actually, you know, anyone can have diabetes, which means anyone. 
So someone who's very, uh, with a high education level, someone who can read, someone who understands numbers, someone who cannot read, someone with no common sense, someone with, uh, you know, ability to take care of themselves. So we have to reach people where they are at any particular time. That may, that may follow a continuum, but we, we need to understand people's needs at any time. A lot of what we do is, is goal setting so that people can manage their own diabetes. And my goals may be completely different from the person with diabetes goals. For instance, I know that lowering your blood sugar will, on the, in the long run, decrease your possibility of complications of diabetes. But the patient's goals may not be to lower their blood sugars as such, but rather to uh, be able to go to work every day or have enough energy to play with their kids or um, just feel well enough to be happy. So we have to, uh, it, with the larger picture of knowing that I would like every person not to have elevated blood sugars and not to have complications of diabetes, uh, we need to understand where everyone is. Um, there is a lot of emotional baggage that comes along with the diagnosis of diabetes. As the woman in the clip was saying, she has shame and guilt, and there's a lot of vocabulary used uh, when people talk about diabetes. Of, good food, bad food, good carbs, bad carbs, behavior, good behavior, bad behavior. And, you know, we try to stay away from anyone feeling guilty about anything that they do. There's, you know, there's a reason for our actions and we want to educate people so that they can make good choices for themselves. To that end, um, a team approach is very important with nurses, nutritionists, uh, exercise people to help people uh, influence all aspects of their life uh, to take care of their diabetes. Um, depression, as we know, is intimately linked with depression. Um, if the blood sugars are elevated, then it makes depression much harder to treat and vice versa, actually. So uh, we spend a lot of time on emotional issues and helping people um, figure out how to take care of them. And, and as LaShawn was saying, there's a huge disparity in the care to patients and so we need to address the issues related specifically to people who are underinsured um, and help everyone where there is, where they are to, to be able to access care and, and the supplies they need to be able to take care of themselves. So continuing our macro to micro trend, um, Howard, I'm hoping that you can talk to us a little bit about some of the uh, technological developments and the actual um, uh, developments in medication and delivery devices um, and how that landscape is, has been shifting over the past few years. So we we're actually reaching a junction now with technology and particularly with communication and smartphones and cloud computing where a lot of the um, issues and challenges that people with diabetes face, both individually and also at the population level intervention can be addressed with, with technology. Uh, some of the barriers and, 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 and issues one, one faces really is the fact that there aren't enough um, endocrinologists or diabetes educators to meet the needs of um, people with, with diabetes. So there's a, a problem with unequal access. Um, a broader issue really in terms of the current care model is, is the fact that uh, people with diabetes really need 24-7 connectivity because the condition where if a person uh, gets into a period of metabolic instability, the glucoses go high or low, um, with a current care model there's not an opportunity to access um, expert guidance and so people end up in the emergency room or, um, in, or hospitalized. Um, I think there's, there's sort of a um, a, a broader challenge and, and, and need here. And, and, and I think Liz sort of mentioned this and there's really sort of a disconnect between the needs of people with diabetes um, and the actual care model. So the current care, care model is very sort of prescriptive. The patient is told what dose they should take, what they should eat, um, which is not only patronizing, but it's actually really effective in, in practice. And I think if I reflect on my career as a clinician, as a diabetologist, it's more been as sort of as a coach. So I think that the key in terms of intervening at an individual level is, is to provide people 
uh, guidance um, so that they can make informed choices around how they need to adjust their insulin, let's say, around uh, different foods or activity, or rather than just simply prescribing a diet is to kind of give them some insight of the impact of their different food choices on their glucoses. So I think the opportunity we have now with, um, with um, smartphones and with the types of connected devices, so for example, connected pens, which um, people use to deliver their insulin, but also um, we'll, we'll send that insulin data up into the cloud for remote analytics is, is to essentially develop an entire cloud-based uh, diabetes care system, which obviously would, would make expert guidance accessible to a lot more uh, people um, living with this condition. So a lot of problems, but it sounds like a hopeful message from all of you um, that, that uh, there are, are sort of insights into how we can do better. Um, and, uh, and so I, I want to actually introduce our, our second clip from the American Diabetes Association, which really looks at uh, some of the success that, um, that they found in, in treating patients. I was diagnosed in my late 30s. My blood sugars were fluctuating. I used to say I can go from 400 to 40 in 40, less than 40 minutes. I was testing my blood sugar once an hour and giving myself eight shots a day to try and keep it in balance. I couldn't live like that. And so I needed a continuous glucose monitor. It warns me when I'm low, it can make adjustments. October 20th at four o'clock in the morning, I woke up and I thought my blood sugar's a little low. And I reached out to get the packet of sugar and that's the last thing I remember. I have a sensor. It um, reads my blood glucose and transmits to my husband's phone. He was in St. Louis and he got an alarm. And he tried to call me, he tried my cell phone, he tried the house phone. My neighbor finally got in. Uh, I was lying in bed with my eyes rolled back. I was ice cold. Without that technology, without the research that NIH and ADA and other organizations do, my husband would have come home from St. Louis and he would have found me dead in bed. And so um, I just can't tell you how much all of this means to me. So Howard, I was hoping that you could put that clip into context for us. It seems to sort of um, jive with some of your uh, some of your work that you're doing. You know, uh, uh, when did this technology sort of become available? How pervasive is it? Is it a, sort of universally available in the country? Um, so what she's uh, referring to in that clip is a continuous glucose monitor. So this is a, a device which uh, um, involves a sort of a transcutaneous sensor. So this is a, a probe that uh, sits under the skin and measures the glucose continuously and really has sort of transformed diabetes management in the, in the past 10 years because Obviously, with I mean, diabetes is a condition where glucose um, will fluctuate markedly, and it's very challenging with current tools, um, even with insulin pumps, for people to regulate their glucose and keep it in, in range. And what uh, continuous glucose monitoring provides, and it is as she relates, is is um, no, is, is data that um, can be linked into alerts and alarms. So she was describing their remote monitoring system that um, her husband has. I mean, the, the opportunity here with this type of technology on a population-wide basis is to actually set up systems where everyone with diabetes um, could um, essentially be monitored in, in real time. We also have devices that can actually uh, measure people's um, insulin delivery. So the opportunity really is not only in terms of actually being able to provide a surveillance system for people um, in emergency situations like this, but with remote uh, monitoring, collecting the data, um, providing people with guidance based on analysis of their glucose trends and their insulin delivery and how they can optimize their control. There's an opportunity now really to sort of scale up and in, in, in provide um, care and optimize um, people's self-management on, on a wide scale. Where things stand in terms of the technology access um, at the moment is um, it's covered for most people with type 1 diabetes, but um, as the technology has, um, has improved, um, the price point has actually dropped. And so there is an opportunity now for people with type 2 diabetes with new, newer types of continuous monitors to, to have access to these kinds of tools. So actually, I want to go back um, to, LaShawn, something you said earlier about 
uh, some of the stigma and shame keeping people from seeking that care? Because I think obviously our w um, the advances in technology are only as good as um, you know the access that that, that uh, people have. And so if, if people are avoiding um, treatment because of, of a sense of shame, I'm wondering if you could sort of um, expand on that and, and tell us you know what you find what you see in the field um, and and actually for any of you if you want to touch on that topic so I, I think um as it relates to stigma one when I initially commented on it I talked about more how it impacts a person with diabetes so as I said people are fearful to disclose that they have diabetes it um, impacts their their willingness or um, just their ability to to engage with their healthcare professional in a meaning, meaningful way. Um, but I think the other side of stigma has to do with the people that are helping to drive that. So, you know, where we see it, um, you know, as we said earlier, I oversee our government affairs and advocacy work at the association. Um, and we have to educate policymakers constantly about what diabetes is and, you know, how it impacts a person and, and why uh, we need federal resources to increase research as it relates to diabetes management and treatment and all of the, you know, the tools and devices, um, why it's important to cover um, programs like the National Diabetes Prevention Program, which is a population-based, community-level um, prevention program that uh, focuses on lifestyle interventions. Um, so, you know, I, I see it play out in that arena in that um, the misinformation part is, is widespread. Um, and, you know, we have this great technology, as he said, that uh, the continuous glucose monitor is an important part of uh, one's management with diabetes. However, you know, getting federal programs to cover it is a challenge. So CMS currently covers um, a, a type of CGM. However, there are still issues around it. Um, Hillary mentioned the intersection with the device in her phone, and that's something that, under this new policy, there are challenges around that. Um, and so stigma plays a role, not only just for the person with diabetes, but I think in the policy environment for policymakers who are making these important decisions about how resources are, are um, allotted for diabetes. Do the rest of you find yourself educating stakeholders about how serious diabetes is and, and to what extent um, you know, it needs to be taken seriously in a policy or research context? From where I sit, so hearing from both Hillary and Michelle, one of the themes that's coming across is once you have diabetes, it is such a hard disease to manage and to have treated um, because it just is so hard for an individual to deal with on their own. And so from where I sit, where I really try to push policymakers is how do you keep someone from getting in that position? How do you prevent the onset of diabetes? And that's where population-based policies, the DPP program that LaShawn mentioned, become these really important vehicles. And that is for both diabetes and obesity because these are long-term chronic conditions for which there is not great infrastructure for all people that need it to have the right tools available to them to reverse these conditions. So from a public health perspective, what we really want to do is try to stop the diseases from ever touching people in the first place. On an individual level, um, if a patient feels shame about the diagnosis of, of diabetes, they will likely not share it. I have, I have patients who don't share it with their family or with their coworkers, which means, you know, if, for instance, if they have a low blood sugar glucose level while they're at work, they, it may not be recognized by their coworkers because they didn't know they had diabetes. Um, and additionally, if, like the first clip, the woman whose grandmother and mother and all her family had diabetes, she has, she, her, for her, the diagnosis of diabetes means she's gonna lose a foot. Right, so she, I mean, there's ways to prevent that, of course, if you keep your diabetes under control, but she's probably just so fearful about the complications of diabetes that that may paralyze her in terms of her own self-treatment. Um, and in that way as well, when we try to use insulin, which is a very effective medication, people have a lot of um, preconceived fears about it and you know, it's, it's, it's a medication that works very well that happens to be an injection. Um, and so it's hard to get people to move forward. It's hard actually to get primary care doctors as well to start their patients on insulin because of that sort of wall between uh, oral agents and insulin. It feels like a huge drop off a cliff. 
Where do you think some of this fear and, and, and shame comes from? Like, where, what is the sort of foundational idea there? Why would it be shameful to have diabetes? Well, I think people feel that it's their fault often. They feel like they've eaten themselves into diabetes, that they're set, you know, I mean, that's the impression that everyone has. You know, it's your, due to your diet and it's due to lack of exercise. And we, you know, we do say that a lot, but it's not, it's nobody's fault. There's certainly a huge amount of factors, which are both genetic and environmental. Um, and, you know, I, I, I have patients who, don't want people to know they have diabetes because those people in their life will then comment on what they're eating, which, you know, back off, right? So, <laughs> so that's, I mean, I think it has, it's, it's hugely packed with emotion, the diagnosis. And that I'm sure makes uh, some of the food policy work harder because there is that fine line, you know, between, um, you know, policing food and then there is sort of an attitude, I think, among some some people that uh, that the food policy recommendations are, are somehow starting to go into that territory. So how do you sort of navigate that in, uh, in your recommendations? Like how do you sort of uh, respond to people who, who maybe feel um, like food policy uh, choices can be sound stigmatizing to some people? Well, it's interesting because if you were to poll the public now or you were to say, um, exactly to your point, do you feel like type 2 diabetes or even obesity is caused because of your individual behavior, because of your broader environment? The vast majority of Americans would say it's because of what you and you and you and you do. I think it's an individual level problem. What the scientific literature points to is that we are living in environments which strongly promote overconsumption of food and, and too little physical activity. And it's that constellation of factors which is driving the joint epidemics of obesity and diabetes. So where it becomes very tricky from a policy perspective is you're trying to get policymakers to do evidence-based policy which is supported by the scientific literature, but their constituents may not want that same type of policy to pass. So if we think about sugary beverage taxes, yes, there are seven places around the country which have had success, but they are hugely contentious legal battles. Um, and until before they even get to that point, they're hugely contentious in the political arena. And so there are many instances where cities have tried and tried and failed. In the case of Philly, which has a tax, it failed twice and then passed. And in a very high profile upset recently, Cook County, Illinois, which would have been the largest jurisdiction to cover a sugary beverage tax, had it and it got repealed. So there's a lot of momentum moving along, but there are a lot of political challenges, um, in part because the constituents are pushing back hard, interest groups are pushing back hard, and the politicians are naturally responsive to the groups that they are beholden to. So Howard, um, going back to what you said earlier about um, in the health coaching aspect of uh, some of the technology that's um, that you've been working on, I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about um, uh, how that plays a role in sort of promoting good behavior um, and uh, and and making that accessible and non-judgmental. And well, okay. you know, d d just as being related, there's a lot of judgment and blame um, in the care process here. Uh, finger pointing a lot to patients, which actually in practice leads a lot of people to, to disengage. Um, and I think in a, a key part act as a clinician is actually acknowledging people's burden in terms of managing their diabetes. Um, and that's actually where a place where technology can actually help in terms of relieving a lot of the, the daily tests. Um, someone had calculated the average person with diabetes is making 300 decisions around their self-management per day, in addition to everything else in life. Um, so it's, it's no surprise that a lot of people don't measure up to what would be ideal um, because of all the other challenges they have to face in life. And that's actually an area where, where technology can help in, in terms of providing uh, guidance and taking a lot of the, the decision making um, out of a person's hands so um, they can kind of get on with their daily activities. Um, and, and then um, further reducing costs in this arena, you mentioned that the continuous um, insulin monitoring and the prices has, has dropped. Um, are there other technologies that you think are more accessible to people due to cost? Um? Well, I, th I think where there's an opportunity in terms of technology and the whole cost equation when it comes to, uh, when it comes to uh, diabetes care is, uh, is really actually um, re-envisioning the whole model. So if you, if you look at the way things are at the moment, the, cu the current guidelines are that people should go and see a, a, a health care um, provider every every three months based on no data the opportunity with remote monitoring is is to risk gratify people based on um, their actual needs um, and and the 
monitoring of their glucose and their, and their insulin dosing so that you could come up with a model where there's some people who are on track, they may only need to be seen once a year. Um, other individuals uh, may need to come in more frequently. I mean, what I frequently find in practice is, is with a lot of people who, just because of competing life demands, who sort of go off track with their diabetes, I'm seeing them six months later um, when I really should have had an opportunity to help um, intervene and guide them uh, much sooner. So there's an opportunity with remote monitoring systems to um, structure the healthcare system so that there's much more cost-effective use of, of healthcare providers. I think the other area where there's huge expenses, and uh, LaShawn had kind of mentioned this, relating to hospitalization with uh, people with diabetes, um, uh, with people who are admitted with severe hypoglycemia, for example, or during transitions of care, when people leave hospital, there's a high risk if they have diabetes that they're going to be readmitted because um, as, the, um, as people recover from health, their metabolic needs may change. And the opportunity really with remote monitoring is, is to be able to um, not only to track those people, to, but to intervene um, and provide guidance um, um, remotely. Um, and think of it for people, the, the patient as well. I mean. The, in, the, in some future state, instead of having to sort of take off time from work to come in to see a, a clinician, a lot of their care um, can be received, um, you know, at home or in the workplace um, on demand. Um, so there, there, there are opportunities there really to sort of scale up in efficiency and, and reduce costs um, with technology. I'm wondering if we can turn the conversation a little bit more towards disparities, and um, this is a question for all of you, but it, based on something Sarah said earlier about how some, you know, some of the policies, um, you're really looking at, at, at how they, uh, they focus specifically on the populations most affected and how the, that those populations are sometimes most resistant to, to, um, to the policies. Um, I'm just wondering if you could talk about sort of what you're, what you're finding um, in the field, like what kinds of disparities you're seeing. and. Uh, and um, what's being done to sort of address, address that stuff. Yeah. So in obesity, there have been these persistent disparities for the several decades where you have blacks having higher rates than whites, for example, and they have just really tracked along and it's really hard to close those gaps. So the question becomes, can you use policy as a way to begin closing some of those gaps? And there has been some success in the case of sugary beverage taxes. So I mentioned Berkeley, the first place in the US to have a sugary beverage tax. They've done um, one study, one of several, where they've looked at, in low-income communities in Berkeley, at sugary beverage consumption. And what they found is that it looks like post-tax, there's about a 21% drop among low-income communities. And that makes sense, because low-income people tend to be more price sensitive. We know they're higher consumers of sugary beverages. So it looks as if the policy is having its intended effect. Now, the really the holy grail question is, does that affect someone's diabetes or obesity? And that is an open question right now. In the case of menu labeling, um, what's interesting is on a given day, a third of adults and a third of kids are in a fast food restaurant. Those numbers are higher for low income and minority adults. And so if it is the case, which we're seeing in our data, that large chain restaurants are dropping high calorie items, that they're taking calories out of the newly introduced stuff, and people tend to be buying those items, then that can also have a big population and level impact of saying, I'm not gonna change the way you eat, I'm not going to redirect you because human behavior is very resistant to change. We have all broken New Year's <laughs> resolutions, I'm sure. But you're just sort of taking someone's environment, pulling some of the calories out, and in doing so, hopefully making them a little bit healthier. Importantly, it's not a conscious decision. So you don't feel like you're being deprived. And it's that moment of deprivation where people largely overcompensate. And that's what you don't want from a calorie perspective. So I do think that menu labeling and sugary beverage taxes have a lot of potential. The challenge is that these are complex diseases and there is no one silver bullet solution. So what you need is a lot of things happening in concert at the individual level among policymakers from the academic science. And when all those things come together, they as a symphony can really start attenuating disparities in a meaningful way. Does anyone else want to discuss disparities? Or? Um, so I, I'll talk a little bit about it. Um, so, you know, this is a, a huge problem I mentioned earlier about the impact of the disease and a lot of um, ethnic and racial minority community, communities are disproportionately impacted by diabetes. Um, one example that I think is important to note because this is an active issue that we're working on relates to the American Indian and Alaska Native community. They have the highest rate of diagnosed diabetes at 15.9%. Um, and so one of the things that we're advocating for on behalf of this community is what's called the Special Diabetes Program. Um, the Special Diabetes Program is 
funding that goes towards um, programming for the American Indian Alaska Native community and also for type one research. And so this program has been a significant federal investment in programming uh, diabetes programs uh, directed at, at these communities and has uh, demonstrated decrease in kidney disease, for example. So um, this is an important investment that's been made over many years, and that's one of these uh, one of the the things that are currently at risk. Um, you know, when I talked about how people don't always policymakers don't always understand the the impact of policies and um, how their decisions matter. Like this program has been in existence for a very long time, and now that funding is at risk. And so that's something that we're advocating on behalf of of um, the American Indian Alaska Native community. So that brings up another interesting point, which is just, you know, um, cultural sensitivity in some of this programming mm -hmm. and making sure that people, mm -hmm. um, it gets back to your point, Liz, of like meeting people where they are, and also just making sure that everything um, that, that, uh, that's being recommended is sort of culturally appropriate. Um, and I'm wondering what challenges um, you face there and, and um, you know, what are some of the programs like this, uh, you know, this program that LaShawn mentioned that, that might sort of help address? Um, some of those issues. Yeah, so uh, again, we do try to reach people where they are and that, you know, I can make uh, many recommendations about a proper diet or exercise, but if someone's living in a neighborhood that has no grocery store uh, close by, that, you know, that's going to be f not feasible. Or if they, um, if there's no parks in the neighborhood, then they can't really do exercise. Or if they're fearful because it's, it's a for their safety, then they may not go out and then they'll stay inside and become socially isolated as well as, you know, sedentary. Um, so you try to understand where, what, what someone's situation is before you recommend just, you know, things that are, would be a pie in the sky. Um, education level, of course, is, is important and, and um, you know, maneuvering the insurance system is, is hard enough for anyone with a PhD uh, and for someone who either has a very low level education or doesn't read or doesn't speak English it's you know it's nearly impossible I don't even understand how it, it is possible so in any way that we could help we do have for instance where I work we have uh, programs specifically aimed at uh, the Latino population and the Asian population, which is also a, a group that's at higher risk, um, and we're expanding those those approaches. Um, f for for instance, in the Hispanic population, losing weight may in fact be a sign of illness as opposed to health. Right, so you have you don't just want to tell someone to um, that they need to lose weight and be skinny because that would well, that would make them feel unattractive and so you, you need to understand every every individual's understanding of you know the factors that are at risk here and I'm wondering Howard in terms of the uh, technological innovation how uh, to what extent is cultural sensitivity and, and sort of approaches that are tailored to different communities a consideration in some of the work that you do I, I think it's sort of obviously sort of key in the sense that um, in terms of the work we do in, with human factors and that technology has to be sort of tailored to the end user and to um, their preferences and, 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 and health literacy. I think where there's a, a broader opportunity and actually, you know, building off what LaShawn Le had, had, had kind of mentioned and, you know, when I, we're talking ab about the scope of the problem and highlighting it, but when you think of what the potential is and how far we've come, when I think professionally 30 years ago, um, at the jaws and the number of patients we had there who were coming in with seeing eye dogs or, you know, in wheelchairs because of amputations and that's no longer the case because we do have the tools to actually substantially impact um, on diabetes. I think the, the issue here really is in terms of scaling up um, access and expertise and, you know, to, to LaShawn's point about if you look at um, retinopathy, diabetic eye disease, which is sort of the leading cause of blindness in the U.S., I mean, what people don't often mentioned in, this, in, in the same sentence, it's only less than 1% of people who have advanced uh, retinopathy who actually end up blind. So if you can um, screen and identify a disease early on, you, one can substantially intervene. And one of the innovations with technology in the last um, 10 years has been the introduction of um, remote telemonitoring so that even in the um, reserves out um, in the Dakotas, um, 
people with diabetes can get access to um, expert eye screening and um, early signs of eye disease can be identified and they can get intervention. So I think there really is an opportunity with the, the types of technologies that we have coming along to have a substantial impact in terms of affecting um, health disparities and providing um, expert guidance and, and care to everyone with diabetes. To, to that end, um, there are programs, as Howard was saying earlier, that there aren't enough specialists in diabetes to take care of the entirety of the problem of diabetes, but, uh, and primary care doctors are the front line. And there are programs where um, a, one specialist will speak to a group of, of primary care doctors remotely, so, you know, in different parts of the world, and try either case discuss or, you know, pathophysiology discussions or various treatment options so that the primary care doctors can have the tools to be able to take care of their whole population of people with diabetes. Um, so before we go to questions, I want to just, um, I was hoping that we could go around and just say one, uh, one uh, area of, of policy or innovation that you are really excited for in the coming year, something that you think is going to make a difference in, in the near term. Um, so I thought sure. we'd start with you, Lashon. Um So I know we talked about a lot of things that are not so great about diabetes and some of the challenges, but something that I'm really excited about um, has to do with the National Diabetes Prevention Program. So starting in 2018, Medicare will cover um, this program as a part of a benefit that it will offer for seniors. And this is a group that is at high risk for developing diabetes. Um, this is something I'm extremely proud of because of the work that the ADA has done starting as far back as 2009. Um, getting, um, working to get the National Diabetes Program established along with other partners and for the funding that um, then followed uh, under the Affordable Care Act. So this is something that has great potential from a population base. It is a scalable community lifestyle intervention program and I'm really excited to see that move forward in the year to come. And I'm most excited about the potential for sugary beverage taxes to meaningfully impact several diseases related to diet, like diabetes and obesity. And I think big picture, food-related policies can really help with these food-related diseases, but it's important that they target environmental change that makes it just easier to make a healthy choice rather than individual change, which is very, very resistant and hard to modify over time. I'm hoping that with um, the concept of accountable care organizations that uh, instead of sort of penalizing patients with diabetes and not paying sufficiently for what they need in the short run, seeing what they what would prevent hugely expensive things and complications and and decrease in, in life expectancy in the long run, that we can better take care of patients by giving them everything they need up front and not treating their complications once they already have them. Uh, a risk of repeating myself, the, 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 the opportunity with, with, with smartphones and cloud computing is to provide uh, diabetes care uh, at scale to, to everyone wherever they live. Great. Well, thanks so much. And um, Lisa, I think, has some questions from online. Um, why don't we take an audience question first? Uh, I think, uh, obviously, you know, uh, physical activity, you know, diet and uh, body weight are among the top predictors of type 2 diabetes and explain a large proportion of uh, diabetes incidence. Although uh, also uh, apparently they are not the only risk factor. I just want to have the uh, panelists' view regarding the role of certain environmental pollutants that are known as uh, endocrine disruptor, obesogenes, diabetogenes, or whatever you want to call them in the etiology of type 2 diabetes. And comments regarding solutions are also appreciated. Thank you very much. Any takers for that question? <laughs> Environmental impacts? I'm certainly no expert in, in endocrine disruptors, but I, I do believe that they play a part in the, in the increased uh, incidence of obesity and possibly diabetes, as well as who knows what el other diseases. So I, I do believe policy should take, take that into account and limit the use of, of pesticides and additives and uh, additives into plastics and all. Um, but again, I'm not an expert in this, but 
I, I don't, as a clinician, I don't know how I would account for it except to tell people to avoid certain um, certain products and pause, you know, wash their vegetables and fruit. <laughs> okay, I think online is Great, back. Thank up you. I'm back up and <laughs> running. <laughs> um, this is a question from Pete Dupree. Hello, as a state TB program manager and TB controller, diabetes is the number one comorbidity we find among our TB patients. I'm curious if anyone is looking at collaborating with diabetes educators and TB clinics on linking at-risk pa patients to appropriate providers. These are hard ones. <laughs> I, I, I am aware of initiatives in, in India where there's a very high prevalence of both TB and diabetes, and it's clearly been identified that um, they interact. I mean, t TB, I mean, like any um, inflammatory condition causing insulin resistance and actually bring on the diabetes, and then hyperglycemia impacting on, on polymorph and immune function. So there, there is work in India um, at at the um, healthcare level in, terms, in clinics, um, integrating both TB and, and, and diabetes care, but I'm not aware of anything uh, in the US around that. Thank you, that's very helpful to hear about that um, outside the US. I know we've talked a lot ab about health insurance, but we've had a couple questions come in about that, so I'll take this one. CGM is a wonderful tool for diabetics, but very expensive. Is there a program that would help cover part of the cost and make it less expensive? Um, as uh, LaShawn was um, mentioning earlier on, the, uh, CMS has recently um, decided to extend coverage for CGM for uh, people with, um, with, with type 1 diabetes, although it's in a, in a, in a restricted way. I think what's going to happen, and we're already sort of seeing this with newer CGM technologies coming along, is, is as, as the uh, adoption increases and the um, production volume has increased, the actual price point for the technology has actually dropped. So I think that's um, inevitably going to make the technology more uh, widely accessible to, to some people with diabetes. But um, so I just wanted to sort of add a broad perspective around health insurance. Um, so every year we survey our diabetes advocates. We have nearly 500,000 um, now. And we send out a survey in July and we ask them what are things that are important to you that we should be focusing on from a legislative and regulatory perspective. Um, I would say for the last uh, five or six years, health insurance um, has been the number one area of concern for people with diabetes because it impacts their access to providers, their access to the tools that they need to manage their diabetes, medications. So this is an area that is extremely important for the diabetes community. Um, you know, as you saw over the last couple of months, that the chronic disease community spoke out when there was an attempt to repeal the Affordable Care Act because this provided um, a foundation for care for people that, you know, if you have, for, for, so for example, I would share with people when I was trying to um, explain how people with diabetes are, are um, benefited from the Affordable Care Act is that you have to go back to the time before there was the Affordable Care Act when simply having diabetes you could be denied coverage or you could be charged extremely high rates for your coverage and so this this area of health insurance and coverage for the tools and devices and technology that people with diabetes need is very important. Thank you. I'll take one more because I know we're running out of time. Um, this is from Emily Keenan. She's a health initiative educator at Virginia Early Childhood Foundation. Her question is, uh, I'll just paraphrase, it's about the accuracy of considering obesity as a marker predictor of diabetes. Obesity in this frame may, may suggest poor diet and thus poor outcomes, but obesity itself is not the cause of health problems such as diabetes. If this is true, can you discuss what needs to happen to reshape this conversation, which is so often framed as shaming and personal responsibility issues rather than a food landscape systems issue? So her question is about you know, how to reframe it so that it isn't so focused on food and um, food shaming, or you were talking a little bit about that earlier. It is the case that the vast majority of people that have type 2 diabetes are also overweight or obese. It's about 90%. It's also the case that if you have obesity and type 2 diabetes and you lose weight, you can often reverse the condition. 
But what's also true is that the reason people become obese is often not simply because they made bad choices, it's because they're surrounded by environments that are promoting those bad choices. So this gets back to the tension between what the public believes about these conditions versus what the science shows. And what the science shows is that these are environmentally driven problems, largely. Individual behavior matters, but it is not the key mechanism. And so in terms of reframing, I think that's where it needs to go. How do we think about modifying the environment in meaningful ways to encourage healthy choices, which make it really easy to make a healthier choice? Great, thank you. Thank you I so think much. There were some more questions in the audience. Yeah. I just had a question. Oh. I just had a question leaning off of that point. In terms of um, food insecurity and the availability of healthy food, have we seen um, state or local governments uh, you know, propose successful initiatives to address that issue of food insecurity within the context of diabetes? So the best way that we have federally of trying to grapple with the problem of food insecurity is through nutrition assistance programs. And so the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, which covers about 44 million Americans, one and two are children, and it's got a price tag of about $76 billion per year, has been shown to both lift people out of poverty, which is really important, and also address both food insecurity and very low food insecurity. So that becomes really important for people that have diabetes. What some research has shown is that for those families that are on food stamp budgets, which is the former name for the SNAP program, is that when they get towards the end of the month, those budgets get depleted quickly. And for patients with hypertension, they're more likely to have hospital readmissions during that time because there simply aren't enough calories that they have in their diet. So at the federal level, that's what's happening. But I think that there's a lot more work to be done because if you take just looking at the SNAP program, it is meant to be supplemental. It's not prevent to be holistic and help people comprehensively deal with food insecurity. So there's a lot more that needs to happen, in, and often the way that that happens at the local level is through food banks and other places, which are largely dependent on charitable donations. And so then you often have a supply side problem of getting the right foods in the right people's hands. Great, I think that's all the, all the time we have. Uh, so thank you so much to our panelists, and thank you for the great questions. And um, we, uh, I, you can continue the conversation um, at the forum website, forumhsph.org. Um, and please join us on December 5th for um, another conversation about the health data revolution. So protecting privacy and improving outcomes using healthcare data. Um, so thanks.